All right. uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mr. Manager. Um, there are certain truths in life, um, truths that you should always keep a lookout for. Um, first of all, always watch out for hop-ons. You got to know what is and what is not a scar. Dot com. And above all, you must remember there's always money in the banana stand. Now, philosophy is on a pretty similar quest. Um, it seeks to separate the, the difference between illusion, the illusion of life from what is just a common trick. Um, in this vein, scholars have united philosophy and popular culture. We're pleased to host for the third time uh, for the authors at Google show um, a segment from that book, in this case, Arrested Development in Philosophy. Um, today, we're joined by Tyler Shores and Chris Phillips. And they are speaking to us today about the, the wisdom that they wrote in several chapters from that book. Um, Tyler Shores is a former Googler. He later received his graduate degree in English literature from the University at Oxford. And he's a frequent contributor to this philosophy and pop culture series. You may remember him from the Heroes show and the um, Inception and in Popular Culture show. Um, also, um, and the girl with the dragon tattoo. How could I forget? Um, Chris Phillips is an ABD graduate and student in philosophy at the University of Iowa and is a frequent editor to this series as well. He's a metaphysics man, also contributed to the book um, Coffee, Grounds for Debate. So without further ado, we'll use the mics for Q&A. So please join me as we ex together explore this tiny town of big ideas, this arrested development and philosophy. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so what we're going to do today, it's going to be a little bit informal. We're going to discuss some of the philosophical issues that arise uh, over the three very short seasons of Arrested Development. And we're going to have sort of a general theme that, that we think comes up in the show. Uh, that theme being, in fact, that it may well be worse to know things than to not know them. Uh, sort of contrary to the theme of philosophy, philosophers are always looking for knowledge and truth and wisdom. We're going to see if Arrested Development can maybe teach us that that's maybe not the best way. Uh, and then it looks like we're going to end up concluding that it is, in fact, uh, not the way you ought to live. So what, we're going to look at what Arrested Development can teach us about how we shouldn't live life. All right. Uh, but before we can really engage in that discussion, uh, we need to sort of get clear on what exactly is the philosophical life? What is philosophy? And what does it mean to engage in this sort of life? Well, Plato. Uh, way back in the day, said that the unexamined life is not worth living. But this raises, I think, two distinct questions. The first one uh, is a fairly important question. That, uh, that question is, what exactly is the examined life? And to answer that question, uh, we need to appeal to the mythos. Plato discusses the mythos. He says this is the sort of unquestioning ignorance that we all have of the way the world actually is. He says that throughout life we sort of grow up and we're told you're supposed to do certain things in your lifetime. You're supposed to get a job, you're supposed to go to college, uh, get married, have 2.4 kids, live in a house with a white picket fence and all this kind of stuff. And that's what will make you happy. This is what you're told. And you're told never to question this. You're never supposed to question it. But we as philosophers do. We think, you know what, maybe that isn't what makes us happy. Do you even know what happiness is? So the second question is, why exactly would such a life not be worth living? Well, Socrates thought that just going through the motions uh, was terrible. And he's gonna, he gave all sorts of reasons. There are a bunch of dialogues and things. You can read those. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of Plato here. We have rest of development to talk about after all. So instead, we're going to ask, uh, why? Um, well, we seek happiness, of course. Um, but we're going to ask, was Plato right? Was Plato right that the unexamined life isn't worth living? And we're going to explore that through issues that come up in Arrested Development. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Tyler for our first section. Yes. Thanks, Chris. So I thought, considering where we are in our audience at Google, we're all familiar at Mountain View specifically with the informal corporate motto of don't be evil. So it seemed like a good place to start for talking about Arrested Development. Ethics in the blue, so there, there's a couple of things we should talk about here. Uh, one of them certainly would be uh, capitalism. We have a couple of interesting chapters which talk about the, uh, the class system and uh, Marxism and 
uh, uh, what kind of representative population the Bluts have for this, uh, this kind of capitalism and really this kind of cartoonish, you know, caricature version of like wealthy capitalists that, you know, uh, like where everything is for sale and anything can be for sale even if it's not. Uh, anything can be twisted to make a buck. Uh, so we're talking about business ethics or the lack thereof in this case. Um, and what happens between, like, you know, one of the things that we see in the show, especially when we're talking about George Sr., uh, what happens when something gets in the way of wanting that money and, you know, actually getting that money? There's a lot of examples. We've got the corn baller, of course, which is legally not for sale anywhere, including Mexico. Uh, the thing is dangerous. If you, it'll burn your fingerprints off. Uh, there is one of the other topics that we talk about that you see throughout the show would be uh, commodification. Everything is for sale, like everything has its price. It's one of those things that we see again and again, this, you know, like crass commercialism of uh, George Bluth Sr. with uh, whether it's religion. Religion can be used to make a quick buck. Um, exploitation has a lot to do with this too. Um, whether it's selling boy fights videos, uh, which are extremely popular in Latin America. Um, or uh, also under capitalism, as philosophers are wont to point out, everything has its price, including people and relationships between uh, one person and another. Uh, this comes up again and again. Uh, one of the things that Marx talks about is this, you know, the primary characteristic of uh, Marxian capitalism is this sort of exploitation, this sort of like, you know, dollar amount or this quantifying of human relations, which, you know, it sounds terrible, but it is something that we engage with more often than we're comfortable to admit. Um, a really good example, uh, because I think it's funny, is uh, Job's suit. Um, this is a good example here, I think. Um, this was from, what episode is this from? People know, was it Afternoon Delight? Banana Stand, I think. Yeah, um, anyways, like the, 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 the running gag with this one was that Job has a suit and it you know, kind of increases in price, like you know, it's first, to, uh, on the first scene there is like, um, oh, he's gonna spill his coffee, but you know. I'm not going to spill coffee over my $3,000 suit. Come on. Uh, you know, I'm not going to help the guy make, who doesn't make this much money in four months. And I'm not going to take a whiz in the uh, $5,000 suit. Anyways, the point is, um, yeah, this is a good example, I think, of like, you know, putting uh, a dollar amount on things. Like, you know, in this, as Marxian proponents might say, is uh, putting a certain capitalistic value on things. Like, you know, does having more money make someone better than another person? We'd like to say no. Um, for Job's case, clearly yes. Uh, that's a good example, I think. Um, that leads to the next point, I think, which uh, we're talking about fam uh, values. One of the values I want to talk about is family values. Or, um, yeah, blue family values have an interesting, um, uh, I don't even know what to call this. An interesting lack thereof of family values. Uh, Anyang, of course, was uh, only adopted by Lucille Bluth in order to teach Buster a lesson for not finishing his cottage cheese. <laughs> so that kind of shows something, I think, about using people. And another thing that Marxians like to talk about, you know, this sort of capitalist critique is like treating people as means to an end instead of like ends as to themselves. So this is an example. Like, you know, you adopt a kid in order to teach another very old man-child, a lesson. Um, so it's interesting to think about this, actually. Um, the family first motto, right? Is, you see this in the very first episode of uh, uh, you know, Arrested Development, and uh, you know, Michael and George Michael are having breakfast, and uh, Michael says, uh, what's the most important thing? Uh, breakfast. <laughs> uh, George Michael is confused. He thought we are talking about things you eat. Uh, but family. Family is the thing that, you know, ostensibly one of the goals, one of the underlying themes of rest development is sort of family first. But family first uh, actually means something different when we're thinking the, the, uh, the Bluth universe. Um, a lot of things, I mean, there's complicated examples. Like I mentioned Lucille. Uh, a lot of Lucille's relationships are defined in terms of power and control. There's a lot of manipulation, a lot of lying, a lot of, you know, playing against each other. And as Buster says, you know, um, she gets off on uh, withholding and uh, these sort of things. Um, so yeah, there's that. You know, there's certainly, it's a very unique version of family uh, values. And family first in this case kind of means like, you know, yeah, family first in the sense that this is a, a resource that can be exploited for our own ends. Um, so there is that, oops, excuse me. 
lastly, like I mean, I guess the point you know to finish up this thought is um, basically the Bluths are. And remember, in one of my favorite episodes, uh, Save Our Bluths, uh, Michael gives this great speech. Right? He says that you know, well, I was really going to give this speech about how we had a, an unlucky break and um, you know there's this great injustice, but I'm not sure that it's true. Uh, we're that's not the truth. We've been getting, given plenty of chances, and maybe the Bluths just aren't worth saving. Maybe we're not that likable. You know, we're very self-centered. And I guess that's kind of the point. Like one of the things that we talk about in the book is that, yeah, in this sense, the Bluths are putting their own, you know, like kind of individual desires before community, before like their shareholders, before their own family members. There is that. And like these, we're talking about ethics and ethical decisions, but a lot of times, like, you know, these ethical decisions uh, seem to be very convenient decisions for Bluth family members. But that leads to our next part, which is when you talk about ethics, one of the things that's really important for philosophers, and all of us are philosophers to some extent because we all do these things, is self-knowledge. And self-knowledge is the next thing that Chris is going to talk about. Great. Yeah, and I just had one more point to maybe tack on to the end there, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like this discussion is absolutely perfect to illustrate the point I tried to make at the very beginning in the introduction. It seems like the Bluth family has bought wholesale into this sort of story that we're told in America. What makes you great is uh, owning cool stuff. Uh, Job is maybe the best example of that with his three, four, five, and six thousand dollar suit. Come on. Um, <laughs> so there's that. But uh, but moving on, as as Tyler was saying, one of the really important things we need to do is sort of get clear on who we are and who we expect ourselves to be. And that's actually a surprisingly complicated question, um, which I think the, the Bluth characters, in particular uh, Job and Tobias Funke, uh, maybe illustrate just how, how difficult this can be. So when we're talking about self-knowledge, we need to sort of get clear on what the self is first. And uh, there, this raises a number of different issues. I think there are four or maybe five interconnected issues when we're talking about uh, the self and how we define it. Um, so there are these different questions of self-identity. And the first one is going to be what I'm calling the metaphysical question. What makes somebody who they are as opposed to somebody else? So here, for example, we have the Richter quintuplets. Uh, we have Andy, who is the show-off. Uh, we have um, Donnie, who's the smart one. Cherith on the end over there is the flirt. Rocky is uh, the tough one. Rocky is the tough one and the stunt double. And we can't show Emmett's face, presumably because he's uh, shy or something. Um, but in any case, they all look the same. They're all, I'll, I'll give it away here, played by the same actor. Sorry to break <laughs> that to you. Um, and so we might wonder, what exactly is it that makes them different from one another? Why are they different people? How are they different people? And what is doing the work of making them different people? We see this throughout the entire show. We see it with Anne, who's played by two different uh, actresses. We see it with George Sr. and Oscar, two different characters played by the same person. And, so, and, and a lot sort of hinges on mistaken identity throughout the show, especially if you're watching closely with uh, George and Oscar. And so one answer to the metaphysical question is to sort of deal with essences essential character traits and things like this, but that can kind of get us into trouble depending on how we go about trying to respond to that. Um, so that's one issue. The next issue is an epistemological issue. Uh, epistemology is the philosophical view that, uh, or the, the area of philosophy where we're concerned with knowledge, how we attain knowledge, what the nature of knowledge is, uh, what's the nature of justification and evidence. And so there are these questions, how exactly do we know who we are? Uh, either in a social sense or in a sort of this deeper metaf or broader metaphysical sense, I shouldn't say deeper. Um, and so this actually gives rise to first and third person questions. Um, the first person question is, how do I know who I am? How do I know that I'm the same person that I used to be? And the third person question is the one that we see played out with the cops constantly throughout this show. How do we know that this is in fact not Oscar? Um, and we have George Sr. as we've been trying to get him for so long. Um, so these are uh, sort of important, relevant questions as well. And then we also have uh, this persistence question. How do I know that I'm the same person from one moment to the next? What connects me to my past and future selves? If I'm concerned with living the good life, I'm concerned with living the good life not just right this minute, but probably also into the future and continuing to do the right thing. So what connects me to that person? And this is sort of a, this is tied closely with the metaphysical issues as well. 
Um, then there's one last question that's important. And we have an entire chapter on this very last question of personal identity. Um, and it's the social issue. In what way is society sort of defining who we are? And how much power do we let them have? Or is it that we're letting them have it at all in the first place? It's not really clear. But all of these things are absolutely important. And they're critical to, not, to sort of get a clear idea of how you might want to respond to it or what exactly is it is that's doing this before we can even try to make sense of how we can be happy or know ourselves. Um, so this is sort of background information. I mentioned Anne a moment ago. Uh, by way of the metaphysical question, she's a, a particularly nice, uh, <laughs> a particularly nice example uh, of someone who has essential characteristics. And all we're given in the show is a basic description of Anne: that she's bland, that she is sort of ambiguously Christian somehow. She lives on Bethlehem time, um, engages in hours of silent prayer, um, and we know that. She does this really adorable thing with an egg where she puts an egg in her mouth and squirts a packet of mayonnaise and... I, I think she calls mm. it a mayon egg. <laughs> it is a mayon egg. <laughs> um, but as a result, we find that, that she in fact gets um, sort of lumped in with this. And I bet I've, I've given talks about this before and in fact most people haven't even recognized that she was played by two different actresses. That's how bland she is. <laughs> Avid fans of the show don't even recognize this. Um, and so people end up sort of, uh, they, they call her different names, they call her Bland, they call her Anne, they say it's as, uh, as Anne as the nose on Plain's face. Um, and so uh, you, you might not think that this is doing the metaphysical work of making her who she is, but it does seem like, as far as the character goes, that does play a very important role. And so that's one example of the metaphysical issues, or uh, response to them. <laughs> What do we do with Tobias? <laughs> Tobias uh, stands in a peculiar relationship to himself. We'll put it that way. Um, he claims to have just, well, he says he just blew himself. Um, that's a strange relationship as far as I can tell. Isn't it amazing what you can find on Google? <laughs> that's not an actual uh, ice cream flavor, sorry. But it looks really cool. Um, but so, so what can... Yeah, let's switch place. So what can, what can Job teach us, or I'm sorry, Tobias teach us about uh, sort of self-awareness or self-knowledge? Well, he believes all sorts of things about himself. He believes that he is an outstanding actor. This is obviously false. <laughs> he also believes that he is a, an accomplished anaurapist. <laughs> and it's okay, it's pronounced anaurapist, not the way you might be thinking. Important um, for people on Google to, I mean, on yes, YouTube to catch that. Don't, don't go Googling on now um, it's, it's supposed to be a combination of analyst and therapist, a professional twice over. But unfortunately, just to really, the business cards got him in trouble for that one. Um, and so everybody else sort of recognizes that Tobias is this total disaster, but he's living in this fantasy world. And Insofar as he's living in this fantasy world, he doesn't seem to be living a very good life. He's convinced himself that he's this great actor. He even misses out on subtle social clues during a job interview, during the, uh, the tryout for uh, uh, the commercial, for the fire sale. He thinks it's actually a fire. And so he acts in a manner that I guess only Tobias would in a fire. But in any way, you get the idea. He's rolling around on the ground singing Amazing Grace. Um, <laughs> Uh, and this sort of demonstrates uh, a ridiculous amount of, of uh, I guess, a ridiculous lack of self-knowledge. Um, and so it seems like this is one of the ways that you don't want to try and structure your life if you're trying to live the good life. Um, his sexual identity is unclear to everyone, probably also himself. We have an article specifically about how uh, he identifies with both genders uh, in various situations and he acts out both male and female character traits. And obviously then there's the double entendres and issues that we'll return to momentarily. Um, but these sort of things seem like they're the kind of things that you need to have a grip on before you can really be happy. 
Uh, one of my favorite Tobias quotes, just to interject, is from uh, the Family Ties episode, where uh, you know the, the long lost Bluth sister apparently comes, and uh, Tobias has this great quote where they're talking about, you know, like, oh, the, the siblings, is it, a, is it a he, is it a she? Uh, he, she, what's the difference? And Tobias says, oh, here, here, in the, in the dark, it all looks the same. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's a good one. That, that kind of, that, that's it in a nutshell, actually. That's right. And so we have a, a really nice quote from one of our contributors here. Uh, we're perplexed, perplexed by Tobias in general and his sexual orientation in particular. Tobias possesses and acts upon both feminine and masculine traits. In the case of Tobias, we can say he's an enigma because he has an ambiguous gender. It's uh, uh, just a little teaser for the book that you should all read immediately. Uh, but what about, what about Job? Um, Job Job is deluded in any number of ways as well. Obviously, he's also convinced that he's an outstanding magician, even though he continuously gives away the secrets to all of the tricks that he vowed to protect forever by creating the uh, Magician's Alliance. Um, uh, he constantly and intentionally loses memories. He carries around what he calls forget-me-nows, but we, of course, all know them as roofies, um, because he wants to protect he thinks, uh, himself and others from uh, giving away the secrets of his craft. But he ends up, it seems, taking them more often than giving them. Uh, he'll witness things that he doesn't really want to see, for example, his parents being intimate in a conjugal trailer, and he will then wipe out his own memory. Well, there's this philosopher, a 17th century philosopher, English guy, John Locke, very important guy, uh, and he maintained that when we're talking about identity over time, you actually have to have a direct memory connection to a previous self in order to be that same person. Without it, it's, we're talking different people. Now, I don't mean different bodies, and I don't mean anything like that. He thinks, Locke thinks, that there can be different persons understood in a morally relevant sense that exist within one body. And with Job, it seems like there are hundreds of people inhabiting his body over the course of his lifetime, precisely because he keeps trying to forget things. Uh, because he finds them disturbing or otherwise. And so <laughs> when you remind him, or when, I, when we don't remind him, when, when Michael reminds him of the terrible things that he's seen, terrible, uh, he freaks out and engages in this discussion of the first person. He says, I've done no such thing. That was not me. I, what, you, what is wrong with you? Where are you getting this? And why are you trying to make me think about that? I have a sense of propriety, Michael. That is an interesting says. question, though. Uh, you know, like, that is not me. Okay, then who was that? What, what Job exactly. was that? The, the forgotten Job, the one without the memory. So, right. interesting questions about uh, memory. Like, that's one of my favorite topics. Like, one of my favorite movies was uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. If you haven't seen it, it's excellent. With Jim Carrey and uh, Kate Winslet, right? Okay. Anyways, yeah, that. I, that question of like a continuity of the memory and if you start forgetting memories which constitute your core self like who are you and if you're not that person that you were five minutes ago then who is that person that's going to be five minutes from now anyways exactly yeah. but Job illustrates self-knowledge in other ways that are that's that's helpful uh, we have this excellent chapter on on Sartre and bad faith uh, Sartre has this sense of uh, what makes us different from other beings is that we have a radical freedom to do whatever it is that we set ourselves to do. And we don't allow social roles or factors to define who we are and what we are. And so living in good faith is an exercise of that radical freedom. To not sort of fall into the, the sort of social roles and let them define you or your actions or things like this. And so he has this example, Sartre does, of a waiter. Uh, and he says of the waiter that his movement is too quick and too forward, a little too precise, a little too rapid. He comes toward the patrons with a step a little too quick. He bends forward a little too eagerly. His voice, his eyes express an interest a little too solicitous for the order of the customer. But this sounds an awful lot like Job right before the Save Our Bluths benefit. Job takes on the role of a waiter for a little bit because he thinks it's hilarious. With club sauce. Right, with club sauce. He, he does this because Job is exercising this sort of ironic notion that he would ever work for a living. This is not the kind of role that he would ever enter into. He's not subservient to anyone. And so he is, has this moment of radical self-awareness 
when he's pretending to serve food to his mother at the at, at the uh, um, the country club. The country club, the name of it, yeah. right? While they're while they're pitching for to try and get people to donate money to save the Bluths, and so he, even though he's acting ironically. He's acting in good faith because he's not letting this role that he's taken on define him and define who he is and what he is. In fact, he's making fun of the role itself and performing it. And so he continues on and he does this. And, and so ultimately, as is what often happens, uh, Job ends up falling into the role and letting the role sort of take over for him. Yes? Why is he being He is. He's always subservient to his mother. That's for sure. That's a fair point. But not to the role itself, not to the role of being a waiter. This is, this is he thinks, hilarious and ironic. But he does end up buying into it. And in fact, he gets very upset when, uh, at the Save Our Blues benefit, people start leaving because the food was inedible. And then he realized he wasn't going to make the money that he was supposed to make as a server. And he let the role sort of take over for him, or take him, take him over. And so of course, we have him in perhaps the best role that he ever is as a magician. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's where I'm going to leave off here on the, on the identity issue. Um, but there's a lot of sort of rich philosophical issues that, that happen here. Uh, and there's a lot to, to continue talking about. But we have, uh, we have more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, too. Thanks for the question about like, different roles. That's something we're going to talk yeah. about and hopefully uh, chat about with you guys even more with the uh, question and answers. Um, but to continue, to move onwards, our third point in how not to live a philosophical life, according to Arrested Development, um, is say exactly what you mean. Uh, I'm a word nerd, so I love the, the word play and then the use and abuse of language in Arrested Development. I think that, to me personally, like my personal theory is, it's one of the things that makes the show just so funny is the fact you know, that there's this kind of twisting and playfulness with language for sure. Uh, we've got an example of the literal doctor. I'll get to that in a second. Um, we have an excellent chapter on that where we talk about uh, language in the book. And uh, there's a good example, if you remember from the, um, the wedding, uh, when um, George Michael and maybe get uh, pretend married, but then they actually get married, even though they thought it was a fake wedding. So uh, that's a good example, because it says a lot about language. One of the things that I'm interested in is uh, it's something that J.L. Austin, this um, uh, philosopher of language, calls performative speech. And performative speech is basically not just language that describes something, uh, like you know, I am you know, standing here. Uh, performative speech is more like something that does something that it's actually, it's performing the action that it's, it's talking about. That happens when you say, I pronounce you man and wife. It happens when you're saying something like, I promise, I swear, I bet. These are all kind of examples of performative speech. Um, there's something, if we have time at the end, I'd like to talk about it, is just like what language is? Like what effects does language have? And, you know, like what makes something real? Like, I don't know, Chris, maybe you have, that's a big question. But, that's a huge uh, question. Uh, you know, like for example, like to, all right, to use the wedding example even more. So like, you know, I am a, an ordained minister according to my like, you know, thing that I got from the internet. Um, and that's a, that's a fair question, I think, about, uh, you know, like, what is real? Like, what makes something actually real? And what, what well, like, how do we understand these rules? Um, the point is, that, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that language sometimes has a very real effect in the world. Uh, specifically for us, what we're interested in is that language has humorous effects. Uh, context is absolutely everything. Um, when we're talking about, uh, you know, like how a joke happens, like you know, obviously it needs at least two parties, the you know the speaker and the hearer. Um, but it also, like, you know, we have to incorporate a lot of things when we're talking about the humorous effects of language. It's the context. It's the role of the speaker, the role of the audience, the um, uh, the historical period, and kind of the cultural, you know, uh, milieu that the speaker and the audience inhabit. Um, so in order to, like, you know, we have to be in a certain place in a certain time. Uh, in order to like understand certain jokes, and I think Arrested Development does that extremely well. Like here's one of my favorite examples, right? Literal Doctor. Um, so when Tobias was hit by a car, um, <laughs> he he was also blue at the time. So like he uh, you know uh, he, no one could see him in the dark. Um, when Lindsay says, "How's my husband?" Literal Doctor says, "It looks like he's dead," which everyone is horrified to read about or hear about. And then Michael, like, you know, this isn't the first encounter with the literal doctor. So at this point, Michael says, wait, he looks like he's dead or he is dead. And the literal doctor says, it looks like he's dead. He's covered in blue paint or something. And, you know, like, okay, so, like, literally speaking, 
it, it, like when you're reading it on paper, like you know, it, it's not entirely unreasonable to understand what the literal doctor was trying to say. But that's why it's funny is the fact that you know they play with language in this sort of way. And there's tons of examples like this of you know one person saying one thing and actually you know taking that unintended meaning uh, to mean something else. This is probably my second favorite related uh, Joe Bluth clip. This was when uh, Joe was apparently married for a little while to his uh, uh, Amy Poehler, is that her name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, his real life wife played this uh, yes. role of uh, Job's wife in this episode. Um, I really have to read this. Like, I wish we could do a, we could even do a stage reading of this, but I'll, do, I'll just, uh, do, I'll do, do you this want one. To? I'd be happy to. Yes, let's actually. Oh, this will be, this will, this will be fantastic. I'm, I'm excited. I'll, I'll play um, Job's wife. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so, like, just to give this a little more context, like, you know, like I'm saying, like, so much of the um, what's funny about Arrested Development has to do with the um, uh, what the hearer interprets or misinterprets. And in this case, like, you know, Job and Job's wife are playing the role of speaker and hearer in this case. So, when Job's wife says, "I'll start," I'm in love with your brother-in-law. You're in love with your own brother, the one in the army? No, I'm in love with your sister's husband, <laughs> uh, Michael. Michael. <laughs> No, that's your sister's brother. <laughs> no, I'm my sister's brother. Me. You're in love with me. <laughs> no, I'm in love with Tobias. My brother-in-law? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, we have this really good, uh, one of our contributors like really broke down this section and like literally speaking, if you take it from word to word, like there are ways in which this isn't entirely like inaccurate. You could, if you were Job or someone like Job, read it this way. Um, but most people don't. Like again, like context has a lot to do with it. Like it should have been clear based on the roles involved. Like you know, this is a fairly straightforward, not confusing conversation. But it's really funny this way. Um, and again, like the point I'm trying to make is that uh, you know, words are never uttered in a vacuum, right? So like meaning is never understood outside of the context of uh, like where it is this thing happens. So in this case, it's the context of speaker um, and hearer. Uh, the context of our, our dramatic reading here was sort of like the context of you know husband, uh, wife, very confused husband who also is a brother and has you know brothers in law, these sort of things. So you know perfect use of humor uh, through language and arrested development. One of the things that, again, like to kind of elaborate on the, the theory I have that language is one of the things that makes rest of development so funny for us is the use of abusive language. Because it reveals interesting things about how, how normal language works, uh, like the fact of you know, how a particular utterance what it means and these sort of things. Uh, but basically, when Arrested Development plays with language in this sort of way, uh, it kind of it takes it out of its normal everyday use. And it actually makes us pay attention. If you go back and rewatch episodes or write philosophy chapters on these sort of things, it makes you think about how normal language works by seeing how normal language doesn't work. Um, so I think that's one of the values of the show. Whoops. Let's save that one for a second. Um, and I, I guess. <clears throat> Here's another, like, uh, I'll read this one. We don't have to do a dramatic reading on this one. But this okay. is a Tobias quote that I rather like. Um, I don't remember what episode. Maybe, maybe someone out there will uh, know. But he's talking to Lucille. And he says, you know, Mother Lucille, there's a psychological concept known as denial that I believe you're evincing. It's when a thought is so hateful that the mind literally rejects it. Uh, Lucille then says, you are a worse psychiatrist than you are a son-in-law. And you will never get work as an actor because you have no talent. And Tobias says, well, she's not going to say anything. I certainly can't help her. So <laughs> it's a good example of communication. Communication takes two roles. It needs a speaker and a hearer. In this case, we have you know, like what ostensibly should have been a successful communication act, one person saying something and another person saying something. But in this case, you know, like it doesn't work if the hearer is just Tobias and completely <laughs> oblivious. Um, but I've thought about this, like you know, because we are here, authors at Google, and like I've, I've, I've done, I've been on both ends of these talks a lot. It kind of made me think about what a, uh, you know, what is it a speaker does? Like what is communication? And a lot of it has to do with not so much um, what a speaker says so much, because a lot of these things we're not presenting so many new ideas as we are as taking ideas that a lot of us are already familiar with and saying them in a different way. And I feel like that's a lot of what communication is, and maybe even like a fair description of philosophy sometimes is, you know, like saying things in a slightly different way to get us to think about these things. So anyways, um, the last quote I wanted to read is, um, do we have the Freud one up here? No. Uh, there, there is a Freud quote about um, Freud's definition of a joke, like what a joke is. I actually think it's a good one. Uh, Freud says, and I quote, the pleasure of a joke lies in a kind of economy. At all times, we're expanding energy and monitoring our subconscious so as to ensure that our conscious perceptions come through a filtering control. 
the, the joke, because it breaks down the control, gives the monitoring system a holiday. So, I mean, that's a, that's a very um, long-winded way of saying, you know, like, that is one of the things that we like about, we enjoy about humor and sitcoms and these sort of things, is it gives us a, a break. Like, you know, it's that, that relief of how the world normally should be, even if for a second, if like a split second of like the laugh and the joke, uh, that is one of the things that we enjoy, the, the, you know, the pleasure of comedy. Um, so moving on to point number four, which Chris is gonna talk about. Absolutely. So the fourth way that, that, uh, that you're not supposed to live um, is to ignore the value of experience, previous experiences for knowledge. And you might think this is a jarring shift from technical discussion of language to, uh, to knowledge generally, but knowledge is, I think, naturally imparted through language. That's how we sort of, that's what we're doing right now. Uh, when it's written, when it's spoken, we, there's all sorts of ways that you can sort of me, uh, muck things up. And of course, uh, another way that you can sort of ruin things is by ignoring your past. We mentioned this before with Job and the, the roofies that he keeps taking. Um, there are other times where he takes them that we'll see um, strategically so that he doesn't have to learn from his mistakes. The huge mistakes that he keeps making. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this, this one cracks me up. Sorry. Um, okay, so uh, we value the role of experience generally in, uh, in knowledge. Uh, we, want it, we always say you should learn from your past. We're seeking knowledge. We're seeking self-knowledge, self-awareness, awareness of the world around us. Uh, we take knowledge to be something that's valuable. But what exactly is knowledge? Um, this is something that we're going to discuss a little bit here. We have a couple chapters on this. Um, and uh, experience plays a fairly important role, but exactly how do we cash out experience? What role does it play? One of the issues is that uh, the Bluths tend to ignore all past experiences. Job especially, as I mentioned, continually makes huge mistakes, and he continually makes the same huge mistake over and over and over again. It's almost always based on some lame character trait. Uh, but Buster here can help us illustrate another point about knowledge, uh, about how tricky knowledge can actually be. So there's this classic problem, <laughs> uh, and it takes an academic to come up with something like this. Um, and Buster is, is something of an academic. He's certainly had plenty of graduate school, uh, as have I. Um, I hope that, that what I'm doing is a little bit more practical than uh, 18th century agrarian business theory or cartography. Um, but you know, then again, I do philosophy, and so to my parents, it's all the same. Um, so in any case, he's an academic. He seems to know all sorts of things. But does he really know much of anything? And does, does he know anything that actually matters? We see here he's uh, <laughs> a little bit frightened by Oscar, uh, maybe with good reason. Um, and we, all, we also have found out through some sort of uh, interesting experiences that Oscar is, in fact, Buster's real father. But does Buster know that? He, the way in which he comes to know it seems to be sort of problematic. He hits all the sort of classic requirements for knowledge. Buster, in fact, believes that Oscar is his father. He has good reason to believe it. In fact, a guy who looks just like his uncle came to him in the middle of the night and said, I'm not your uncle, I'm your father. And it turns out that it's in fact true that Oscar is his father. But what's, what, what's crazy about this, and what seems to make it a problem, is that the man who said, I'm not your uncle, I'm your father, was George Sr. in a wig. Right? So he has evidence for this true belief, but it seems like the evidence is bad evidence. Because if he had gotten clear about who was telling him that it was his father, he would have never come across this, uh, what's actually true, belief. So does he really know? Uh, I'm not sure. There are all kinds of philosophers who um, are really concerned with this, primarily epistemologists. I have a chapter on that with one of my friends. Um, but so what? Maybe, maybe Buster doesn't know uh, in this sort of ridiculous, convoluted philosophical sense. All that matters is that he was able to confront Lucille, and then she confirmed it, and that's good enough. We're off and running. But, Consider Wayne Jarvis. This is uh, the replacement for Barry Zuckercorn, who then turned around and started uh, prosecuting the Bluth family. So he seemed to know a bunch of things, too. And he certainly thought he knew what he was seeing, right? So we, we were talking about experience and how experience plays an important role in knowledge. 
And we take visual experience or the senses to be a pretty good indicator that we are learning something. But uh, Wayne Jarvis was looking at a photograph that he got off of the uh, Bluth Company server. Does anybody remember what the photograph was? Or what he thought it was? Let's, I won't make you say anything crude. They thought it was Iraqi landscape because George was being charged with having built houses on, uh, in Iraq. And so what he thought was that he saw a picture of Iraqi landscape, which was where they were building houses to hide weapons of mass destruction. And he saw this precisely because, you might say, he's a prosecutor. He's looking for incriminating evidence. So when he comes across a photograph that might look like landscape, he's going to see it exactly as that. And this is a, an issue in philosophy, in the philosophy of science in particular, but in epistemology generally, called the theory ladenness of observation. That is, we, cert we see certain things, not just sort of for what they are, but we interpret them, and our sort of background theories are informing the way that we experience the world all the time. And so part of the problem is that, as we saw in that first slide, uh, Barry was able to point out that it was in fact not an Iraqi landscape, but was uh, Tobias's balls. <laughs> so that's, I'm, I, I'm not gonna subject you to the actual photo. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. But unlike, unlike uh, uh, so, so Wayne Jarvis is unlike Job in that he probably learned from this. He probably got a little bit embarrassed, um, almost started a war uh, on, the result of, or on the basis of this. So it was pretty bad evidence, pretty flimsy. Um, but the Bluths show us what not to do. Jarvis sort of points us at something that we need to be aware of in order to not make the same huge mistake. But, but Job, on the other hand here, um, do you want to do, do another reenactment? Yes. Okay. I call Steve Holt. <laughs> Steve Holt. Okay. I've made a huge mistake. I know the feeling. I had you. <laughs> I'm your father, Steve Holt. I can't hide from it anymore. I won't forget this, <laughs> Dad. <laughs> I will. And then he pops a roofie, <laughs> drinks it, and then in a tender moment says, I will, <laughs> crying a little bit. So again, we have this situation where Job is sort of forced to be aware of his own mistakes. He's self-aware and forced to be confronted with it in the most impassioned way possible. And yet he decides, nope, I'm out. I don't want this. I don't want to learn from it. I don't want real life experiences. Um, going back to the previous discussion, somebody else can have it. Wrapping things up, this brings us to point number five about how not to live a, or how to live a philosophical life according to Arrested Development. Um, this one would be about telling good stories. And I think narrative is, uh, you know, like the story structure of Arrested Development is very unique. And it's certainly one of the things that I'm most interested in. Um, uh, this was the chapter that I wrote. You should check it out. It's awesome. Um, but there's a lot to say about Arrested Development uh, as, a, as an actual sitcom. In a lot of ways, I think you can even, you know, like you can understand Arrested Development as a show about television. Uh, think about it as this, you know, pseudo documentary with a voiceover narrative, constant cut, cut forwards and flashbacks and these sort of things. So it kind of plays with the conventions of like what a documentary is and what's, what can or can't be done on television. Let me take a step back and talk about, uh, in the chapter I talk about, uh, in the poetics, Aristotle, a Greek philosopher from uh, 380 BC, uh, talks about what a story is. A story is a thing that it has to have a beginning, middle, and an ending. Like it has to have some sort of structure. It has to have provide us as story receivers or readers with some sort of sense of like you know how things are going to get from one place to another. Um, we create stories because we want to explain why things are the way they are, how they relate, and um, you know how they begin and how they end. Otherwise, we're left with something like a you know like a Samuel Beckett play where it's just sort of a lot of nothingness. Um, but if you think about what television is, and specifically like the narration in Arrested Development, um, I think it helps us, you know, not unlike what I was talking about before with language, how it plays with language, it helps us kind of think about the ways that we, uh, how we relate to stories the way we do and why we find meaning in the world through stories. Um, we really do like narrative. We really do like stories. There's a certain pleasure that we get from, you know, like, um, uh, how we make sense of uh, events. And uh, in a lot of ways, a lot of philosophers think that narrative, thinking in terms of narrative, is actually at the root of human thought. Um, we tend to like a lot of things we do, whether it's 
gossiping or telling stories or dreaming or uh, whatever, like these all have some sort of structure with it, someone doing something, going somewhere, or uh, some variation of that. So narrative is kind of like a, you know, it, it, it's certainly an important means for us to find how we learn about the world and how we learn about ourselves, I think. Um, I mean, think about when you're a kid for a second, right? So like think about the, uh, the kind of delight that you get when you reach the end of a story and reach like the end. Um, where that delight comes from is kind of like something that I, I write about in this chapter, and it gives us hope basically that there's an underlying structure to things, that you know, in real life things don't happen that way. There is no you know, beginning, middle, and end. Like things don't usually happen on time, or there's not usually like a, seer, uh, a clear, excuse me, uh, tidy sense of resolution. That's how life is. So narrative is our way of kind of imposing meaning on things. When we tell the stories about things, we like things to make sense. We like them to lead from one thing to another. Um, narrative asks us, you know, not only questions of why, but what. Um, there's an example, I'm gonna skip this one. Uh, we'll come back to it, I promise. In the chapter, I talk about how stories can be used. Stories can be used for pretty much anything, just like statistics or, um, you know, um, any other uh, types of things. Like, um, the bad news, the good news is that we can use stories for whatever purposes we want. The bad news is that we can use stories for whatever purpose that we want. Uh, in this case, there's the uh, J. Walter Weatherman, the uh, one-armed man. Uh, th this was certainly uh, one of my favorite things when, uh, uh, you know, like the point of these were like they were, George Sr. was trying to teach the kids a lesson. Uh, that's why you don't leave a note. That's why you don't yell. Um, and, you know, like he's always doing this. And uh, when Michael says, uh, you know, I want the guy with the, uh, the one with the fake arm and the fake blood, I want Walter Weatherman. Uh, how do I get a hold of him? And then uh, George Sr. Uh, you know, he says, like, uh, yeah, he's dead. You killed him when you left the... Uh, <laughs> the door open on the air conditioner. So it, it's this kind of, this is a good example, I think, of, of sort of like appropriating stories for a lot of different meanings. Like George Sr. does this, you know, you know, easily, like slipping without even like a second thought. So that's kind of a good example, I think, of what this does. Like this is a way that we sort of twist stories to fit our own means. Um, anyways, one of the most important characters I want to talk of as we're sort of wrapping things up and then uh, uh, get to everyone's questions is the, uh, the narrator, of course. Ron Howard is the narrator. It's one of my favorite characters, and I think he has some of the best lines of the show. Um, narration and storytelling basically entails a certain act of interpretation. There's always some sort of interpreting, some sort of moral choice about meaning, what you include in a story and what you leave out and what that says about you if you're telling the story about yourself. Um, and again, this kind of like, you know, this narrative convention in Arrested Development kind of gives us a luxury we don't normally have. My favorite example, and it seemed apropos for today's talk, is um, when uh, Lindsay is, uh, maybe he's off shooting a movie somewhere, and uh, Lindsay guesses that uh, maybe is in Sacramento for her debate club uh, semifinals. And the narrator very quickly jumps in and says, um, uh, there is no, you know, she was not in, uh, there was no debate club, and a quick Google search of the word Sacramento came up with zero results in the following helpful question, did you mean Sacramento? So it's a quick, like, you know, one second thing, but the idea behind that is, like, you know, there's this built-in narrative safety net of, like, you know, we don't always, like I said, when we talk about narrative interpretation, we don't always get things right. The Duluths rarely get things right, and that's where the narratives, the narrator's role comes in to kind of put things, um, you know, in the right place. And I guess to kind of like wrap up my thoughts on this, I want to leave you with a, uh, a quote from uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, Nietzsche um, where he says basically, and this is a good model not only for understanding rest of development, but something for us to just think about. Um, Nietzsche, Nietzsche wants us to uh, be more like the artist who can kind of see as an object as, uh, you know, um, and attention, like you pay attention to both like the big and the small details. So what basically what Nietzsche is saying is that an artist has the kind of like the capability of like framing things in a certain way so that you're looking at only certain parts. The analogy that we're trying to use here is that, you know, like that's basically what we do not only in watching Arrested Development, but kind of what we're doing when we're talking about all the things uh, within our life. Like we're picking selective moments, we're picture framing things and putting things in a certain context. So Nietzsche says we need to be more like poets and, you know, realize like we're making kind of like uh, art out of our own lives. And do you have any closing thoughts to add before we wrap things up? Um, I was gonna say, uh, I guess, just as, uh, just as with any good story, um, we're gonna have to call it a day here and leave you hopefully wanting more. Um, the book, of course, is uh, uh, an attempt to sort of introduce you to ways to avoid making huge mistakes. Um, and uh, I hope that we've uh, been able to point out some of the ways that you, in fact, ought not live according to uh, the Bluths. So thank you for being here, and thank you for listening. Thanks.
So we have questions at the mic and at these roving microphones. <laughs> if you had to pick a favorite to episode, Chris, which one would you pick? It might be peer pressure. Okay, peer pressure. I think good. peer pressure might be. Um, I'd go with SOBs. That's a very uh, meta humor one. It's, it's, of course, where they're making all the jokes about Arrested Development getting canceled and, uh, you know, like, well, uh, yeah, save our show. And um, uh -huh. the, the home buyers, home <laughs> um, buyers, what does the O stand for? Home Builders Organization. Well, yeah, they don't want us. That's right. So it's yeah. showtime. So it's showtime. Us. Yeah. yeah. It's going to have to be showtime. Let's put on a show. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how, how would you um, comment on the, the use and the metaphor of, of the OC and like the culture of, of, of life down there throughout the show? It's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it, it, there's certainly kind of like a, a, a fantasy land uh, aspect to it. It kind of reminds me of the, uh, the Simpsons in a lot of mm -hmm. ways, where like Springfield, where is Springfield? Uh, you know, like everywhere or nowhere. Uh, the OC is kind of like that too, where they have like a, a conveniently have a little England, little Britain. There's no little Britain in the OC, right? I mean, I, don't, there, I, I Googled it once, there's not. Uh, <laughs> but you know, like they kind of add these things to like kind of suit the conventions or the conveniences of the show. So there's something about that. Um, I don't know, I mean, it's a good question because I don't really know what to think about the, uh, and what's with the whole don't call it that thing? Like, is it just a? Uh, it's a just a reference to the TV show. Yeah. Okay. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I was, I was going to say also, just sort of adding on that, we do have a chapter in the book um, on the sort of upscale culture, uh, or trying to like fake it into the upscale culture, uh, and so I think a part of that is both the send up of this sort of American dream, um, and then also maybe a, a critique of putting yourself into, into really awful situations in order to fulfill this dream that's itself kind of a joke. Um, and so that's a, a, another one of the chapters in the, that's, that's worth considering. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's one of the sub-issues that's going on there. Mm -hmm. Hi. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I wanted to ask, what, was, what has been the reception of a work like this? within the broader fields of uh, film studies and philosophy um, in the acad academic community? Uh, by and large, philosophers, I think, are, are a fickle bunch. Um, and so I think that there's um, sort of a mixed reception within the philosophical community about the way these kinds of works are received. Uh, I think that the, the right way to view them is introducing core philosophical issues to a broader audience, trying to uh, take ourselves out of, so to speak, the ivory tower uh, and right down on the, next to the banana stand on the, uh, on the boardwalk in the OC and sort of spread the word. Um, I, I couldn't speak to the, the film community. I'm not really sure. Um, I do have a cool anecdote, though. I met David Cross last week um, in Iowa. Weird, right? Um, but I met David Cross in a bar, and I presented him a copy of the book. And he was so excited, he actually started reading it out loud to other members or other people who were at the bar. Uh, so that was pretty much the highlight of my life. Um, <laughs> forget the forget the degrees, you know, those don't matter compared to this. And what about the idea of narrator as character and as omniscient person and as Ron Howard? Well, I mean, that's a good question too, because I mean. Um, uh, um, the narrator is certainly in a uh, unique position in the show where, uh, you remember the, uh, the one where um, uh, uh, Kitty is at the bar and she's threatening um, Michael and um, you know, she says like, did you hear that everyone? Michael Bluth is threatening me. And then she, uh, you know, like she flashes everyone. And John Beard, who was actually a Los Angeles uh, Fox News uh, uh, anchor, uh, he was in that and uh, he was like, you know, I gotta get out of here. I can't be part of the story. I can't be part of the story. I can't be seen. And then he's on the news later with this thing that says eyewitness, which is really clever because it says I instead of like eyewitness, and he's saying, you know, like, oh, a local woman bears all at local, uh, you know, at a, uh, at a bar, uh, news at 11, sources say, and like, you know, the source he's talking about is himself. So that kind of like the John Beard appearance was sort of like a, you know, like a surrogate for the narrator character. I mean, the, the problem with the narrator like that is that they're both character, they're both narrator and participant sometimes. And that's basically, I guess one of the things I talk about in my book is that we're always in that role. Like when we're telling, we're always telling stories about ourselves. We're both our narrators and our main characters. So that's hard. Like how do you separate yourself from 
being the person telling the story, but also the one telling the story about yourself. So those are the kind of questions I'm always interested in. I think it's you know well worth thinking about because these are things that we engage with every day, whether we realize it or not. All right, well, Tyler and Chris, thanks for stopping by and speaking with us for Authors of Google. Thanks. Thank you.